Yes, we are live, ma'am. Uh, shall we start? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. A very good evening uh, to all the attendees, esteemed faculty members, and dear research scholars and students who have joined us again today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to day two of the three-day webinar series on language and literature organized by the Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram Campus, Chennai. Today's webinar features a lecture presentation entitled Voices from the Harem, Revisiting Delacroix's Les Formes d'Alger. And we have in our midst Professor Dr. Meda Karmakar from the Department of French School of Arts and Sciences, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, who is going to enlighten us on this thought-provoking topic in Francophone literature. Uh, as usual, before we move on to the welcome address, I would like to gently remind all the attendees who have joined us today to stay with us till the end of the session to access the feedback link. And please don't forget to post your queries, if any, in the live chat stream on YouTube only during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, I would like to now call upon Dr. Rama, Professor and Head, Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Walter. Uh, good evening, friends. Hearty welcome to day two of the three-day webinar series organized by the Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram campus. After an insightful address yesterday by Dr. Bhaskaran Nair, we move to day two, and we have with us today Professor Meda Karmakar, Department of French, Rutgers University. With her very rich and varied experience, I'm sure the attendees will be definitely enlightened by her scholarly talk today. Professor Meda is very friendly and unassuming scholar of French, and I take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to her for having consented to be the resource person today and share her thoughts on the topic, Voices of the Harith. Thank you very much, Dr. Meda. I welcome you most heartily. And I hand the session over to my colleague, Dr. Walter, for the introductory remarks. Over to you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce the guest speaker of the day, uh, Professor Dr. Meda Karmakar, who despite her extensive profile, is a person of great modesty. I hope I do justice to her magnanimity. Dr. Meda Nirodi Karmakar graduated with a BA in French from Elphinstone College, Mumbai, a master's in translation and interpretation from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. She has also done a master's in French literature from the University of Iowa in the US and a PhD in French literature from the Ohio State University. She taught at the Université de Picardie in France for over a year, was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. She received an NEH fellowship and taught French language in a women's prison she was also director of the six week summer in Paris program and currently teaches French language and literature at Rutgers University, New Jersey. Dr. Karmakar is an experienced researcher and an avid reader. Her research publications include Madame de Charrière et la Révolution des Idées and articles on women writers and poets such as Isabelle de Charrière, Marceline Desbord de Valmore and Adelaide de Souza. She presents papers regularly at international conferences. Her current research focuses on Francophone women writers and artists from North and West Africa and the Caribbean, and on ecofeminism in the works of Alice Walker, Shani Motu, Maris Conde, and Giselle Pinot. Professor Karmakar is an experienced, dynamic, and enthusiastic person, and we are really privileged to have her as our resource person and guest speaker today. Uh, before I hand over the forum to Dr. Meda Kamakar, and not to be too unfaithful uh, to the French language which made us cross paths in the first place, a few words in French, if I may. Uh, C'est vraiment un très, très grand plaisir de vous inviter, madame, 
à partager avec nous vos connaissances et vos perspectives sur un sujet très intéressant. Je vous accueille chaleureusement, madame, et je vous passe la parole. Over to you, ma'am. Merci infiniment, Walter, et uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rama, for the wonderful introduction, and Walter, too. And uh, so the title of my paper is Voices from the Harem, um, Revisiting the La Croix from Dalgé. Um, in the spring of 2010, at the Zimali Art Museum at the university where I teach, the French department and Amisal, the Department of African, Middle Eastern, and South Asian languages and literatures, were all abuzz with excitement. This young and dynamic Moroccan artist and photographer, Lala Esaidi, was to display her Femme du Maroc, a collection of 17 large scale photographs at our museum. I was intrigued by her Femme du Maroc, or Women of Morocco, as the title immediately evoked French 19th century painter Eugène de la Croix's famous Femme d'Alger a series of two paintings of four women in a harem in Alger, one in 1834 and the second in 1848. Lala Esaidi, who was born in Morocco, grew up in a harem herself with her three step stepmothers and 10 siblings. Has studied in the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in, uh, in Paris and in the School of Fine Arts in Boston. She now lives in the United States, but returns frequently to her old home close to Marrakech, Morocco. Her mère poétique, or literary mother, the Francophone Algerian writer, journalist, activist, historian, filmmaker, and feminist, Asya Jabbar, born Fatma Zohra Imalayen, was, was raised in colonial Algeria, studied in Paris, taught in Morocco, Tunisia, and the US. The diasporic voices of these two women of two different generations seem to thus unite in their preoccupations with the treatment of women of the Maghreb, past and present, the need to tell their stories, and the need to tell their stories. Asia Jabbar had published her collection of short stories from d'Alger dans leur appartement in 1980, about 25 years after Picasso had painted his own Femme d'Alger, consisting of 15 oil paintings and many drawings based on the Delacroix painting. Now, walking through the Zimali Museum and catching sight of Lala Esaidi's return to these, 18th, to these 19th century Orientalist paintings, including De La Croix Femme d'Alger, in her own arrangement of four women with one standing and three reclining in the same languid poses, I wondered why one would return to this painting yet again in the 21st century, one that has generated so much controversy over the years. And of course, you're probably wondering why I myself would take up this much discussed topic. And that is perhaps because we as teachers know that the same work of literature or art can keep revealing new meaning in the classroom or in our own rereadings. And as, a, as Professor uh, Bhaskar and Nair pointed out so eloquently in his talk yesterday, we keep on learning from our students. And uh, I will be elaborating on this point a bit later in the presentation. So what is it that moves and inspires Jabbar in the 1980 scriptural and oral take on De La Croix's 19th century painting. And SID in 2005 in her pictural and photographic one. What did Jabbar and SID hope to do for De La Croix's women of the harem? How does their gaze differ from the Orientalist objectifying male gaze of, sign, of silence and immobility? These are some of the questions we'll be trying to answer as we go along. Eugène de la Croix would transgressively enter a harem in 1832, soon after the French conquest of Algeria. Let into this cloistered interior, 
by, and I quote, a former little pirate, now a conquered chouch, who is henceforth accountable to a French civil servant, end of quote. And this was from uh, one of Jabbar's interviews. And would paint femme d'Alchi dans leur appartement, or women of Algiers in their apartment, on his return to France, to much success in 1834. And I'm gonna show you um, the first slide, which is the painting from Dalgi. And uh, we will be returning to this slide uh, often, as you will see, because this is the, uh, this is the first one uh, that was painted in 1834. And, um, okay, 15 years later, the fascination remains, and a second version will appear in 1849. <laughs> So this is the, the second version that he came back to. Uh, in her own collection of Femme d'Alger, Delacroix's title and painting will be used by Jabbar on her cover. She describes the painter's four women as submissive prisoners of a closed space lighted with a kind of dream light emanating from nowhere, light of a greenhouse or an aquarium. The genius of Delacroix is to make them at the same time both present and distant, enigmatic to the greatest degree, end of quote. As we are well aware, Delacroix, as a foreigner and a man, would never have been able to see these intimate quarters before the French conquest of Algeria in 1830. Arriving two years later, as the critic Mildred Mortimer says, and I quote, the painter joins in, Fran joins in France's colonial venture. His gaze is therefore inextricably linked to the colonial conquest." End of quote. The French colonial project in North Africa was initiated in the early 1800s. The time of quiet imperialism, as it came to be known, was a subtle but sustained military and cultural assault. In Edward Said's groundbreaking book on Orientalism, published in 1978, he describes Napoleon's conquest of Egypt in 1798 as the beginning of modern Orientalism, as Napoleon took with him linguists, historians, anthropologists, sociologists, and scientists, along with the soldiers. According to Said, the West looks upon these cultures and people as static and undeveloped, underdeveloped, creating the view that the Orient and its peoples can be studied, understood, and eventually controlled. He states that this implicitly implies the idea that Western society is developed, rational, flexible, and superior. For some like Picasso, who had never set foot in the Maghreb, it represented not so much the other, as an inverted mirror image of a familiar reality. A notable manifestation of the Orientalist fantasy overlaid by the Maghrebi reality is of course a representation of women as objects of desire, as we shall see in our analysis of Delacroix and Picasso's Femme d'Alchi, Algerian women in their apartment. The 1704 translation into French by Antoine Galland of Les Mille et Une Nuits, The Arabian Nights, had already set the wheels of Orientalism turning. Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres would paint his Grand Odalis in 1814 without ever stepping outside France. And this is the Grand Odalis. Uh, and uh, others like uh, Jean-Léon Jérôme with his snake charmer and other nudes, orientalist fantasies as critics have called them. French forces captured Algeria in 1830 on the pretext of being insulted by the Ottoman, last Ottoman ruler, 
for Sende, which would remain under French rule until Algerian independence in 1962. Soon after, as we said earlier, Delacroix was able to accompany the French ambassador on a diplomatic mission to Morocco and Algeria and observe and record firsthand the colors, people, architecture, and life in this exotic land. And of course, this unexpected privileged view of the unveiled Arab women in the intimate space of their apartment. As Jabbar says in her short story entitled, Regard volé sans coupé, forbidden gaze, severed sound, if Delacroix's painting unconsciously fascinates us, it's not actually because it suggests that superficial orient within a luxurious and silent semi-darkness, but because by placing us in the position of onlookers in front of these women, it reminds us that ordinarily we have no right to be there. This painting itself is a stolen glance. End of quote. He would return to France with seven notebooks filled with sketches and another with 18 watercolors from which he would paint his femme d'Alger. About a century later, Picasso would do his own 15 paintings of Delacroix's Les Femmes d'Alger from 1954 to 55. And this is just one of his paintings. Um, his version of four women in the harem, now energetic, unencumbered, uh, for the most part, by any clothes, will be interpreted by Asya Jabbar as one that corresponds with the freedom she finds missing from the Delacroix version. Picasso seemingly gives his women, especially the black servant, who has lost her racial specificity, more agency as she seems to be dancing and the limbs of the one in the middle elevated. The fragmentation that goes with his cubits Cubist style perhaps gives it more freedom and sets the painting in motion. As Jabbar puts it, and I quote, there is no harem anymore. Its door is wide open and the light is streaming in. There isn't even the servante espion, the spying servant anymore. Simply another woman, mischievous and dancing. I don't know if you can really make out uh, the servant. She's somewhere in the middle towards the back. Jabbar interprets the fact that the women are partially nude as if Picasso was recovering the truth of the vernacular language that in Arabic designates the dévoilé or unveiled or the dénudé or denuded. Jabbar wonders if Picasso wasn't making that denuding into a sign of an emancipation but rather of these women's rebirth to their own bodies. Historically, this emancipation and denuding suggested by Picasso's femme d'Alchi did come during the seven-year Algerian War of Independence, when many women threw off their veils, wore Western clothes, and fought alongside the men against the French colonialists. There's a wonderful film by Ponte Corvo, uh, which uh, tells about this war. Uh, but as Jabbar put it in the story entitled Regard Interdit Sans Coupé, a forbidden gaze severed sound of a femme d'Alger, once the war ends and independence is achieved in 1962, these brave young women who had risked their lives, often captured and tortured, as uh, one of Jabbar's characters, Sarah, in one of the stories, who bears the scars of torture on her body, and muses that she squandered her youth, crammed with other adolescent prisoners in the infamous prison of Barbarous. These same porters de feu or carriers of bombs are now sent back to the harem or its stifling equivalent. As Amanda Barris Ford notes, that even if Jabbar and her compatriot Anissa Bouyaryed are convinced that the timing of his painting signified his support for the Algerian independence, he had made no public statements to support the FLN, the Front, uh, the front, um, the liberation, uh, front of liberation, national liberation, or sign the manifesto. He did finally agree to help Simone de Beauvoir 
and Giselle Halimi in their call to save Jamila Bupacha, one of the porters of the bomb. And uh, I have that picture here for you. Um, Jabbar mentioned, um, this is ja Jamila Bupacha. Uh, she's the one mentioned by Jabbar, who was wrongly accused during the Algerian war, imprisoned, tortured, raped, and condemned to death. And the poster that Picasso created did indeed help her cause. Feminist critics questioned the idea of the deep eroticization of Picasso's women of Algiers, especially since their pneumatic nakedness does not leave much to the imagination. And one cannot help but be critical of Picasso's appropriation of Delacroix's Orientalist paintings based on real Algerian women, so to speak, as he is nonetheless participating in a Western fantasy of the Orient. The luxurious cushions, colorful rugs, jewels, and decorations may be gone in the Picasso paintings, but the nargile or hookah lingers on, as does what Ezra calls the colonial unconscious. And uh, this is the cover of uh, Asya Jabbar's uh, novel, uh, short stories. If Asya Jabbar does use the Lacroix and Picasso's paintings as her point of departure, she has the advantage of writing from within the harem and without. Her women of Algiers are real women. She remembers, although now fictionalized. They are, and I quote, fragmented, remembered, reconstituted conversations. I could have listened to these voices in no matter what language, non-written, non-recorded, transmitted, only by chains. The chains of echoes and sighs, she says in her ouverture, the opening chapter. Each story is told in a woman's voice to a friend or a polyphony of voices of Baya and a family in the courtyard, be it Sarah, who is a music researcher, passionate about old songs, secretive about her own participation in the Algerian war, until her friend Anne asks her about a large scar on her back that turns out to be a scar from her years in prison and torture at the hands of the French colonizers. A polyphony of women's voices in public bath is comforting to Anne, who's a French woman herself, but has uh, been born and brought up in uh, uh, Alger, who is recovering from a suicide attempt. The woman who weeps is based on the title again of a Picasso painting taken from his anti-war mural Guernica, is about outrage in Jabbar's Leila at a country where freedom from subjugation for all she did, did not include women. The theme of memory is ever present. A woman's memory spans centuries, says Jabbar in her story entitled, Nostalgia of the Horde. Great grandmother is a storyteller who tells her children about her life with sadness and humor. The old woman talks about her own father-in-law's mother, who, and I quote, was a young bride the year the French came into our town, end of quote. In the afterword, Jabbar says, and I quote, this is precisely how Algerian women relay the past. They tell the story of colonization, but tell it otherwise. As Clary Zimra, Zimra puts it, and I quote, in each story in Les Femmes d'Alger, the real tragedy of incommunicability, the great drama of dehumanization wrought by war strikes only the men. For the women, however imperfectly, have each other. They have a history that binds them together. Because as the great grandmother of the horde makes it plain, it has come down to them through the centuries of the oral tradition. End of quote. In her exhibition entitled Femme du Maroc, later published in the form of a book, there is a collection of large photographs taken of women dressed in fabric on which an elaborate calligraphy in henna 
covers the bodies of the models and then the walls around them. The continuity of her writing then wraps around her women seems to speak of a conversation that is inclusive, fluid, and ongoing. After the writing that can take several months and draping up to eight hours, the Isai, that Asaidi restages 19th century orientalist tableau. And she says, I always had this love-hate relationship with orientalist painting. I find them exquisite, but at the same time, the content is absolutely outrageous, end of quote. In her own version of the Delacroix painting, I have a feeling I got my pages mixed up a bit. That's what happens when you don't put numbers on them. Um, well, I'll just show you the slide while I'm rearranging my pink, uh, my pictures. So this is um, this is Les Femmes du Maroc, Women from Morocco by Lala Esaidi. So, um, in her own version of the Delacroix painting. Asaidi seems to place herself squarely in the debate which Jen Doi in her Women and Visual Culture identifies as one about sexuality, class, race, the body, and the gendered spectator, which this painting has inspired in recent days, recent years, sorry, end of quote. In her own rendering, Asaidi's title, Femme du Maroc, Women of Morocco, indicates a geographical displacement from Algeria to her own country of origin. So if you look at this painting, uh, this, uh, well, it's a, a photographic montage. If you look at it, you will see that uh, she recreates exactly, at least the positions of the women, the, uh, the, the femme d'Alger that uh, Delacroix painted. And, um, so Morocco is still part of the Maghreb and where Delacroix had first landed and her desire to make these women her own. Similar in some ways to the Picasso painting, Esaidi's room is bathed with light, eliminating the shadows over the faces in the Delacroix that seem to evoke mystery and pain. Furthermore, even if the poses are almost the same, the exotic orientalist elements that Delacroix Regard volé, stolen gaze, seized and used to titillate his French viewers, the luxurious drapes, rugs, and cushions, and the bright costumes, even the hookah from the Picasso painting, have all disappeared. In their place, Esaidi's young woman, women are in brightly lit, in a brightly lit area that's almost stark in its simplicity. And the only color she uses are subdued shades of white and sepia. SID, continuing in Jabbar's foot, uh, footsteps, turns Delacroix's orientalist framing of the harem on its head. If her project is indeed, and I quote, de reviser, de corriger des stéréotypes, revise and cor correct stereotypes, SID thus echoes some of the criticism that Jabbar levied against Delacroix's femme d'Algerie, and she uses irony and humor in her exaggeratedly huge photos, when she juxtaposes the Orientalist paintings of the great masters like Delacroix, Ingres, and Jérôme with her own completely female versions. The drapes accentuate the theatricality of the moment since the door has disappeared from the Delacroix painting and is replaced with a white wall covered with calligraphy. Gone are the nudes of the scantily clad women and the odalisques are now completely covered with fabric. Veil, so to speak, but in a novel way. That is again written over with calligraphy, a subversive act as this highest form of Islamic art traditionally used to transcribe the Quran or other sacred literature is being used to write about women, personal freedom and cultural identity. 
The Arabic writing on the women and the walls makes them blend in with their surroundings, less visible, and thus more res resistant to visual consumption. It is the writing that serves the double function of offering fragments of poetry and autobiographical musings to the reader. Taken from Isaidi's own diaries and from the women who collaborate with her in the photographic sessions, but also often befuddling the viewer by rendering all linear reading impossible. Even readers of Arabic, like the person who was translating for me, said that the beautiful calligraphy in henna was not always readable. And we both decided that this must be uh, interpreted as uh, deliberate. In an interview, Asaidi too admitted that she preferred not translating what she had written in Arabic for the viewers. The fragmentation of the writing that makes it undecipherable to the viewer is in some ways a little unsettling, reminiscent of Picasso's fragmented women um, of his paintings. There's a performative aspect to the photographs where the women mimic oriental poses but merrily rearrange themselves in the in the next frame. And so I'll, I'll show you a few more just so that you get the idea. It's like um, a rehearsal or something where she's getting her uh, characters ready for um, the next event, the next uh, tableau. Um, according to Nicholas Mirzov, the visual from the visual cultural reader, the uh, and I quote, the civilizing mission of the French in their African colonies involved a very vigorous visual col colonialism, ranging from maps, photographs, and paintings to collections of indigenous arts and crafts that had a significant role to play in explaining, defining, and justifying the colonial order. However, with Delacroix's four women, as we have seen before, they are in an imaginary place a phantas phantasm of the West. As Malik Alula puts it, there is no phantasm though without sex. And in the Orientalism, in this Orientalism, a central figure emerges, the very embodiment of the obsession, the harem, end of quote. However, contrary to the Orientalist representations of the harem as a closed space of sexual subjugation, SID like Jabbar before her, portrays her harem as a female space where the women are not, and I quote, bearers of meaning, but the bearers, makers of meaning, as Laura Mulvey famously wrote about the male gaze in her article, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema. As a feminist or an Islamic feminist, as Miriam Cook would call her, as one who studies the lives of the forgotten women, Esaidi's mission is to return the gaze from the diaspora. The harem looks back. As a photographer, she will be able to look through her lens and become a female photographer voyeur, except that in so doing, she subverts the stereotype that is attached to the bodies of women. Or as Olu Ogibe would say in his article on photography and the substance of the image, that examines the incursion of the voyeuristic camera in Africa, and I quote, in bringing so manipulative a uh, medium as photography to bear upon the body of another. The presence behind the camera must be the photographic encounter oh, yeah. this is where um, yeah, the photographer encounter becomes one of trespass and violation, end of quote. Dubbed by the Moroccan feminist Fatima Mernisi, and I quote, as a spinner of scenarios more dangerous than Sherazad in her introduction to the commemorative book brought out after the uh, Femme du Maroc exhibition uh, by Lala Esaidi in 2009. Esaidi combines, and I quote, seditious talisman like ninth century writing on tissues called washi, which harem women used to bewitch Abbasid caliphs with the latest visual technologies such as installation 
and camera manipulation, end of quote. However, Asaidi's writing is not merely decorative, but serves a purpose. Like Jabbar before her, she wishes for her women to speak, for their voices to be heard. The architecture of a photographic space thus serves as a bridge between the past and present. She seems to answer Jabbar's questions as posed by her Sufi Sierra, the water carrier, and I quote, Today, how do I craft words out of so many tons of voices still suspended in the silences of yesterday's harem? Words of the veiled body, language that in turn has taken the veil for so long a time, end of quote. Jabbar's words, now echoed by Asaidi, are addressed to Les Nouvelles Femmes d'Alger, the new women of Algiers, new women of Algiers, who are momentarily blinded by the sun as they cross the threshold. Do they free themselves? Do we free ourselves altogether from the relationship with their own bodies, a relationship lived in the shadows until now, as they have done throughout the centuries? End of quote. When asked by Fatima Merinisi as to why she felt the need to veil the Odalis, Saidi replied, and I quote, My veil is made up of words that remind the viewer that a woman is a creature who has her own communicative strategy. As I mentioned in the beginning of my paper, a classroom is a very fertile place for new ideas. In 2018, when I was in Paris with my Rutgers students and teaching a francophone literature class. There was also a Delacroix retrospective going on at the Louvre where I took my students. It was, um, yeah, we can go back to the, the first uh, slide, I guess, so you can see the painting again. Um, it was easy to see the fascination that we all felt for this beautiful painting. Although we had already discussed the question of Orientalism, we had also been perplexed by the dismissive way in which Jabbar talked about the black woman on the right side of the painting. She was called an accessory character by Jabbar and later a spy, which evoked the missing male authority that exercised his power through the black woman. The inescapably dramatic nature <coughs> of the way this black woman is painted <coughs> excuse me, seems to suggest, as one of my students pointed out, an important role in the painting. And if she wasn't, why wasn't she dropped from the 1848 painting? Emmer O'Brien, in her article, Veiled Vision, is one of the few critics to speak of the importance of this servant, how she seems to have more mobility. With her right foot raised, I think you can see it better in the, the first version. Um, her right foot raised as if she's about to leave. O'Brien attributes Jabbar's dismissal of the woman due to cultural familiarity. And by lucky coincidence, I happened to be visiting a contemporary Martinican artist, Elizabeth Colombo, who's currently researching the presence of black figures in the 19th century paintings. Manet's Olympia, for instance, where a black servant is delivering a bouquet to a white nude and other such paintings. And she's restoring the black figures, repainting these, uh, these paintings by putting the black figures in the middle of the painting, in the center. This is in keeping with Asaidi's own idea of the black servant, who is no longer dressed differently, thereby erasing class differences and race differences, but integrated into the group of four and into the conversation. She also occasionally moves from the edge to the center in the reimagining of a tableau. Lala Esaidi, like Asya Jabbar before her, and like many other Arab women that followed, Edward Said's 1984 advice to snatch the permission 
to narrate from those who monopolize the power to speak for others. Although Arab women no longer live for the most part in harems today, Jabbar and Asaidi still see the lasting effects of colonialism and its aftermath, and the patriarchal need to keep women safe from the other, still silent and motionless, as they are shown in Delacroix's painting. But we will end with Sarah from Le Fam Dalshi, Jabbar's Fam Dalshi, who calls out to her Arab sisters to learn to talk to one another, and I quote, for Arab women, I see only one single way to unlock everything. Talk, talk without stopping about yesterday and today. Talk among ourselves in all of the women's quarters. Look outside, outside the walls and the prisons. The woman as look and the woman as voice. End of quote. Thank you. And that ends my presentation. I hope that was the right length. Walter, back to you. Let's see. Thank you so much, ma'am. Hey, you're welcome. A few technological uh, we, will, uh, we will have a short uh, discussion. Uh, yes. And uh, we will also okay. take some yeah, questions welcome. from the participants. Yes, I welcome uh, questions and comments, of so course. Uh, we will uh, have a short discussion first. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Very much so. Uh, ma'am, there were, there were a, a few uh, uh, points uh, which mm -hmm. I would like to put to you. Uh, basically, the paintings, uh, how do they represent uh, Algerian women's identity? Uh, could you elaborate mm -hmm. more on that? Yes. So the paintings, uh, which are considered Orientalist paintings uh, by the Lacroix and uh, Jerome and many of the other Orientalists, um, they are uh, what um, Asya Jabbar and uh, Lalai Saidi and uh, uh, some of the other critics think are uh, a view imposed upon the Algerian women because uh, for them the harem does not represent a masculine space or rather a space that uh, is sexualized what that that where women are uh, supine uh, you know available for male consumption for them the harem represents a female space where they're often uh, it's like a genese with uh, with uh, uh, families, sometimes children, and lots of uh, female uh, conversations. And so that in itself is misrepresented by these artists. And also, as I said in my paper, many of these artists had not even visited the Orient. The Lacroix is perhaps one of the few who had actually gone to a harem and sketched these women. But um, obviously he took all these sketches and he came back and he um, transformed his own, um, his own um, um, visit by uh, all these um, ornaments and things that he added to them. So that's why one cannot say it's a very fair rendering of uh, the Arab uh, reality. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, one more thing which was uh, posted earlier actually by uh, one of the participants. I would just like to add a few, uh, add a point to that. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, the so what is what do you think about uh, the ethnicity of uh, uh, was the ethnicity of uh, Algerian women uh, portrayed in the paintings uh, and uh, how how significant are the paintings to that to the ethnic uh, identity mm -hmm. of the Algerian? Yeah, so. Um, a lot of the painters, including Delacroix, uh, seem and Picasso especially, you know, they use their own models a lot of the time. They use the French models to uh, represent these women. So um, they were very light-skinned, of course, the women, 
but they uh, uh, they sort of um, um, made them more um, like uh, Algerian women by uh, with all the the peacock fans so that was for um, you know um, the angles odalisk you know they put all these props around them so uh, I think you were asking if they were representative of the actual women that lived in the harem. Uh, they were highly Europeanized, actually. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, shall we uh, take a few questions from the participants? Mm -hmm. I will just make uh, uh, the questions, the relevant questions appear on the screen and you can uh, yeah. have a look at them and answer them. Okay, thank you. So the first question by Mr. Venkat Raguram. Okay. So are you talking about, um, well, I don't know. I can't engage in conversation, right? Um, yeah. So um, a lot of the women have uh, taken this to heart. Uh, for them, the, uh, the Algerian um, women themselves uh, were allowed to uh, or encouraged to take part in the Algerian war. And uh, after the war ended, as uh, we saw in the, with the, in the case of Sarah, uh, they were uh, dismissively sent back to the uh, to the harem and uh, a, or a domestic space, and they were not expected to uh, participate in any of the outdoor activities. And uh, I think for a year, the FLN um, was um, more um, encouraging towards women leaving. Uh, participating in a more public space but um, once um, uh, I think it was um, I think the regime changed after a year uh, the FLN became more and more um, against women's participation and uh, they um, of course as we know uh, they became uh, more and more uh, with the Arabization, the politics of Arabization, and also the, um, the radicalization. Um, women had a smaller and smaller role. I don't know if that was the answer, the yes. right answer to your question. Yes, yes, I can understand what you said, ma'am, there uh, about the FLM and uh, uh, the politics of Arabization, because that was what uh, was more predominant. And uh, that uh, made a lot of uh, change in the in the particular uh, identity uh, crisis, you can say, of the women. Mm -hmm. There is another question by the uh, uh, same uh, faculty. Okay. Algeria uh, being a transit point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so in the very beginning, um, I don't, I don't know the impact of, um, I don't really know the answer, the exact answer to the impact of prostitution, but, uh, yes, there are, um, Algerian prostitutes, like with all immigrants, uh, but, um, in the very beginning, um, during uh, during colonization and also immediately after colonization, um, there was a need for manpower. So a lot of Algerians were encouraged to go work in France, and uh, which led to widespread immigration. And uh, it's only later on that the um, that the um, the flow was sort of stemmed and uh, there was increasing um, anger against uh, the Algerian and uh, I should say the um, uh, North A American, uh, North African presence in France. So, uh, yes, I suppose poverty and, uh, you know, all the problems that they have in the suburbs of Paris are related to 
uh, the immigration, of course. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Uh, there is another question by S. Bharati. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, cultural identity uh, means um, that it's an identity related to, um, it could be related to where you are born or where you are raised or um, the society you um, belong to. Like for Lala Esaidi, her cultural identity, as she says, is both Moroccan and uh, American because she lives in America too. But it is one of, um, um, for her personally, she says, her cultural identity is very much linked to her childhood where she grew up in Morocco. And uh, she was raised as a Muslim woman with all the, um, the strictness. In fact, she had to, um, she was often punished and sent to uh, um, a different uh, building where actually, uh, paradoxically, she has been photographing her women because that uh, building still remains. Um, and so her cultural identity is linked to uh, her um, birthplace, actually. But she says it has been um, sort of, I don't know if you could say contaminated or enriched by her, um, the her her yes. uh, the day you know her uh, living in France, living in the U.S. I don't hey, know. Uh, yeah. You, you explain the you explain the uh, uh, the context of the paintings and uh, their significance. So so eventually, what did the what did the Delacroix want to convey? With the paintings, mm -hmm. what do they exactly represent or indicate, uh, yeah. and, and to what end? Yeah, that's a great question because um, Delacroix, in some ways, has been very unfairly attacked because um, he, um, I think, it's more the other Orientalists who have uh, pretty much, um, what would you call it? Um, you know. Uh, projected this life, this um, Algerian uh, reality in very negative ways. Uh, Delacroix was very much concerned with authenticity. Um, he had all these notebooks where he took sketches and he he's like an um, he has uh, he's like an ethnographic uh, he uh, ethnographist uh, or ethnograph I don't know what the word is uh, and he he took many many notes and he really wanted to present a very authentic portrayal of what he saw in the harem the women and the colors and also uh, the architecture around him. So uh, as far as he's concerned, um, it's a little more ambiguous what his intentions were, whether he really wanted to uh, um, exoticize um, the, the harem and the women and present them as sexual objects because as you see, his, his women were all clothed and uh, there's this dreamy quality which tells us that even though it was meant to be authentic, we still have the light. I don't know if you noticed in the second painting, there was all this light coming in and we don't know the source of the light. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, so he sort of leaves a lot to the imagination. So, yeah, he's a very ambiguous figure in this whole story, actually. Thank you, ma'am. There is a general question uh, by uh, faculty. Balakrishna Vishwanadam. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the influence of France on Algeria um, is still very strong. Even after independence, um, they sent their uh, team of uh, 
of teachers and historians and uh, educators uh, because they wanted, uh, they didn't want to leave Algeria. Uh, well, they could see that Algeria was sort of heading towards a more um, Islamic sort of uh, society. So they wanted to exert their influence. So for a long time, there was a lot of give and take between the countries. But then, as we know, uh, when it became more and more integrist, in fact, they had no more um, with the Arabization and also with the, this very radical government. Uh, what happened is a lot of uh, the women fled, including Asya Jabbar. She had to flee. Uh, they went into exile because there was a lot of... Um, upheaval and a lot of uh, um, attacks on women. So they had to exile themselves. And uh, so the influence of the French uh, grew less and less. It wasn't the case with the rest of North Africa, Tunisia and uh, Mor Morocco, as you know, were protectorates uh, while uh, Algeria was colonized. And even though they were they got their independence. The French still exert uh, more influence there at this moment. Uh, do you know anything about the authenticity of the paintings of the Algerian women? One participant is uh, just. Yeah, uh, so we we cannot definitely say whether how authentic they were. But we do have historical records that show us that uh, um, that Delacroix did indeed get access to this harem, and he did indeed sketch those women uh, that he saw. So, um, to the extent that an artist now we can never talk about um, anything being authentic, like a photograph would be, for instance because the artist evidently always brings his imagination and his creativity to um, a work of art. But to the extent of um, what he saw and what he thought he saw and painted, it is supposed to be more authentic than any of the other paintings yes. that, that yes. were doubly colonized, like uh, Picasso's paintings were doubly colonizing um, what, because he was colonizing what Delacroix had painted. So, yes. Uh, Ma'am, we will take uh, two more questions. Uh, these questions are spe uh, quite specific in nature. Okay. And then we will uh, end the Q&A session after. So, one of the questions is by Dr. Pranava. Do you perceive Muslim women as facing double jeopardy? Yes, uh, that's a, a wonderful question. Um, it is true. Uh, I like the word double jeopardy because as women and then as the colonized, yes, uh, they they were hurt in, uh, yeah, doubly hurt for sure, yes. And uh, so um, the discourse must be feminist and political. And of course, the feminist will say that feminism is political. Um, yes. And for instance, um, uh, the the idea I was trying to convey by this presentation was that um, it's less voyeuristic and um, it's less um, harmful to the presentation of women if women themselves speak from within. So generally, when we talk about somebody behind a camera, it's a sort of a voyeuristic activity where uh, they are, um, you know, uh, spying on the, they're objectifying the, the their, uh, uh, whoever they're filming or whoever they're photographing. But when it's a woman behind the camera, one imagines that the dynamic is a little different. And so also with Asya Jabbar telling stories from within the harem, we feel that that's a very powerful voice because she is speaking from within. She knows the realities of the harem. She knows and she lets, oh, the main thing is both these women allow for um, this subjectivity because they don't impose their own um, subjectivity on uh, the other. 
So for instance, with Asya Jabbar, she allows for this polyphony of voices. She allows for all the women to speak. And she acts in some ways like a scribe who's just um, recording whatever all these women have to say, the different points of view. So yes, definitely, it has to be feminist and it has to be political for them to be able to fight colonization, as you said, and uh, the oppression that- uh, Thank you, thank you, ma'am. That was excellently answered, I would say. Oh, we'll we'll take one final question, ma'am. Mm -hmm by madam srunika okay. yes i like that a lot yeah cultural appropriation yes definitely there's a sort of a i don't know if cannibalism is the right word but there is a sort of a cannibalism going on here um where um the lacroix and picasso are, are trying to, and this is part of Orientalism, as Said said, right? Um, you you go in there and you study a culture, and then you have mastered it, and then it is for you to speak about it, and you have, and your voice is suddenly becomes very authentic, and you are able to speak like Delacroix just because he visited Algeria. I know I might sound contradictory here. On the one hand, I said he's a little uh, and often an ambiguous figure, but on the other hand, the fact that he went and he forced himself, it has to be understood that the only way he could go into a harem was because of the power structures at that time. France had colonized uh, Algeria, and so he was able to force his way in some degree, I mean, well, into this harem, which is such a private space, and then act like an expert painting of painting the harem and coming back and um, sort of sharing his paintings and his sketches with the rest of France. And France suddenly had this great understanding of Algeria, which is absolutely uh, not true, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. With that, we come to the end of the, the question and answer session. Uh, I would like to uh, request uh, our HOD, Dr. Rama, to say a few words. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, th thank you, Walter. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Meda, uh, uh, since uh, some of us are not uh, students of uh, French literature or francophone uh, literature, as you call, uh, we may not have understood the smaller nuances of what you said, but um, it was very, very uh, interesting to see the yeah, exquisite yeah. connect, the exquisite connect between uh, the paintings and literature, the French literature. So we were able to see that through your presentation. And uh, another interesting thing that uh, we probably were able to evince in your from your presentation. Um, was that the paintings of the women in the harem was always given a it was very interesting to see and hear that uh, it was given a native color by many of the artists whoever painted that so yeah. like you yeah. said yeah. like you said uh, we don't know the authenticity of many of them but still we enjoyed every single slide you showed us because oh, it was uh, it was uh, very nice and very artful also so uh, oh. i think uh, i think on behalf of our department i have to thank you immensely uh, oh. for the presentation you gave it was very nice so thank you so much for consenting to be our resource person and having spent uh, so much of your uh, time with us thank you ma'am oh you're so welcome walter was very convincing in the beginning i wasn't sure i could do a <laughs> 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 I've never done one before. It seemed so long and so intimidating because I like to be part of a you know a conference where everybody's presenting a paper. And he said, "No, no, no, you're going to be the only one." <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, shall yes, we move on to the to the formal vote of thanks? Yes, uh, Walter. Yes, Walter. Uh, I kindly request uh, my colleague, uh, Doctor. Uh, 
Preetha, Ms. Preetha Basu, Assistant Professor, uh, Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, to deliver the formal vote of thanks. Ms. Preetha Basu, over to you. Yes, thank you, Walter. It gives me immense pleasure to give the vote of thanks today as an end to a wonderfully informative and engaging webinar organized by Department of English and Other Foreign Languages, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Ramapuram, Chennai. At the outset, I would like to thank the Almighty for showering us with grace and blessings for smooth conduction of the program. I would like to thank and place on the record uh, my sincere appreciation to Dr. Medha Karmakar, uh, Professor, Department of French, School of Arts and Science, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, USA, for accepting to conduct this lecture presentation for school and college teaching faculties and research scholars. She has animated this event with uh, her insightful analysis and exemplary knowledge on Francophone literature uh, and Francophone studies. Uh, and we are grateful to have in our midst a resource person of her caliber. And Gram Masi, Madam, uh, I would also you like to thank. <laughs> I would also like to thank Dr. Nalini Jeevanthampi, Professor, Department of French, Pondicherry University, uh, for referring Dr. Karmakar for this webinar. We are immensely grateful to you, ma'am. It goes without saying that the uh, one person who is behind the motivation and success of all our department events is our HOD, Dr. Emma, who by sheer power of will, and by um, and by grace of God is not only a, a dynamic leader but also an incredible support to each and every of our department faculty and is the driving force behind every department event. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I I'll be failing in my duty if I don't place on on record my sincere thanks and appreciation to all the department faculty members who have contributed to the success of this event with their constant moral support. Uh, I would also like to thank my co-coordinators, Dr. Walter, Dr. Savita, and Dr. Nagamuni, who have been instrumental in organizing and coordinating uh, the entire program from start to finish. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, I thank each and every participant for their participation and cooperation in making this event a success. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Preeta. So happy to meet you finally. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Same here. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. With that, we come yes, to the end of the show. Yes, ma'am. Yes, go I ahead, ma'am. You're saying something. Say, uh, a shout out to uh, Nalini uh, Thampi because uh, she's the one, I guess, who brought us all together. <laughs> yes, so, anyway. yes, yes. Okay. Thank yes, you. Ma'am. Very right. big thanks to Dr. Nalini. Uh, Ma'am, yes. thank you so much, uh, Nalini, ma'am, for yes, for bringing us all together, as uh, as Meda, ma'am, said. Uh, thank you all. Thank you yes. to the participants, faculty, research scholars, students uh, from uh, UG and PG who have joined us. Uh, a lot of uh, our, our colleagues also. I thank all of them. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, shall we end the session, ma'am, Rama, ma'am? Yes, yes, yes Thank Bye. you, thank you, Professor Meda. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, Walter. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, bye.